BBC Four Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. supposed to come running up that stage there and uh, talk to you from a great height. And I'll leave that free in case Sir Clive comes along. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the new series of Micro Live. That was Alan Sugar of Amstrad making a rather irreverent dig at Sir Clive Sinclair before launching his IBM compatible personal computer for the cutthroat price of £399. Today we'll be looking at the Amstrad phenomenon, one or two other interesting developments since we were last on the air. We'll be hearing from Sir Clive and from Brian Long of Acorn. And we'll be looking at how you can produce animations on your own home micro. And I'll be joined by John Vince to look at this year's winners from the Computer Animation Festival. When Penguin introduced paperbacks, they created a new popular market for books that had been issued years before as expensive hardbacks. And Alan Sugar of Amstrad seems to be doing the same thing for the computer market as he repackages old hardware into a popular form. Last year, it was a complete word processor, including a printer, for £400. But this was based on an operating system which first appeared in the 1970s. And this year, it's his IBM compatible at a fifth of the price of the original IBM PC, which is now five years old. Amstrad's machine joins an army of 250 clones from the Far East, but it's the cheapest by far. So how does he do it? Well, the simple answer is volume. He's gambling on selling at least 60,000 every month. But not content with that, Sugar has bought Clive Sinclair's company, including the rights to the best-selling Spectrum for a knockdown price of five million pounds. Sir Clive, who pioneered the cheap end of the market, will be the subject of a microlife profile later in the series. Well, he's had his setbacks before, but is he now out of the computer business? What were the terms of your contract uh, with Alan Sugar? Can you, <coughs> can you sell any more computers? Oh, certainly, yes. The, the, the deal was a very simple one. We sold him our existing, and just our existing, computer range and we sold him the right to use the Sinclair name in certain areas and on, in particular on computers. Um, very definitely we did, that did not preclude us and does not preclude us from going and continuing the computer business. Uh, that would have been absurd and would have been a total waste and we, we are very much going to continue in the computer business. But without the Sinclair label? Without, without the Sinclair brand name on the product, yes. Whereas Sinclair failed in the business computer market, Alan Sugar hopes to succeed with his new IBM clone. Besides cutting the price barriers for the hardware, he's also making software prices look very silly. A lot of um, uh, famous vendors of software are, are quite understandably rather uh, reluctant and frightened about this machine because obviously implications are that the machine in some cases costs less than the actual software. And I suppose you can make a simile to that of buying a car where the full tank of petrol costs more than the car. Some software manufacturers are refusing to lower their prices just for this machine. Some are keeping their packages up at the £400 mark. How do you react to that? Well, you see, the thing is, I'm afraid to say that that type of vendor uh, really has got to real start to realise that the industry is changing. And, um, you know, we we're selling a piece of equipment here for £399. Now, there's only one way we can do that, and that's to make a lot of them and sell a lot of them. Um, and uh, until they start to see the light of day, that if their programmes are so good, then if they bring them down to a price which um, people can afford, they will sell a lot more of them. And I'm sure I don't have to explain to you that uh, to sell 50,000 of a programme and receive, for example, a royalty of five pounds on each is better than selling 500 of the programme at 400 pounds, for example. 
So, how has the software market reacted to Alan Sugar's challenge? Many have indeed axed their prices. SageSoft, for example, dropped their software prices by two-thirds. And at Amstrad's launch, they claim to have received half a million pounds worth of advance orders. Lotus, on the other hand, will be doing absolutely nothing about Amstrad. If you want the 123 spreadsheet, you still pay £400 for it. But many software houses like Ashton Tate, Microsoft and CompSoft have yet another solution. Cheaper but restricted versions. For example, the new budget version of CompSoft's Delta is limited to working on 1,000 records rather than 32,000. But you only pay one-fifth of the price. OK, so there's plenty of software. But what about the cheap machines? Well, today we rang around several dealers across the country and not one of them had an IBM, an Amstrad PC in stock to sell us. They all said we'd have to wait several weeks before getting our hands on one. Alan Sugar's a controversial figure. In the past, he's boasted he knows very little about computers. Even so, the rest of the industry see him as a force to be reckoned with. What advice would you give to a newcomer to the computer industry, like Alan Sugar? Well, apart from the fact that I don't like giving advice to somebody who's making as much money as he is right now uh, and doing as well as he is the thing he has set out to do, the only cautionary note I would offer is that he basically makes his money by going into an established technology and developing the high-volume, low-cost product. In this industry, the technology will continue to advance and somebody has to make the machines that Alan Sugar is going to copy in three years' time. One such company is Acorn. If I were in IBM's shoes and I were seeing my market share being whittled away at a fantastic rate, I mean, it is declining very rapidly indeed, I wouldn't um, um, be complacent and I don't think IBM will be. Uh, they're, they're remarkable, it's a remarkable company and they, they don't, uh, you know, they have a history of, 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 of success. So that's a very interesting situation. So is Alan Sugar now riding a dying horse? Um, in a way he is, and of course he knows he is. I mean, it's, it's no product lasts forever, and that one has had five, a five-year run uh, and must be in decline uh, in, 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 in the longer term. But in the shorter term, uh, of course, he can profit from it greatly, and I'm sure he will. Well, IBM's market share of personal computers has been dented by the clones, and its profit for the first nine months is down by an amazing $1 billion. There's even speculation that it may well retreat from the low end of the personal computer market altogether. But what's much more likely is that we'll start making machines that can't be copied. Last week, there were rumours that IBM are collaborating with Intel to put a new multitasking, multi-user operating system, not on a disk, but on a chip. It's already been called the clone killer. Only time will tell. Unlike this, the original IBM PC, the new Amstrad is what's known as a full 16-bit machine. What does that mean? And come to that, what is an 8 or a 32-bit machine? Well, the number refers to the processor at the heart of the machine and how many bits of information it can handle at once. So we have 8, 16 and 32-bit processors. Now, you might expect that a 32-bit processor would be twice as fast as a 16-bit and a 16-bit twice as fast as an 8-bit. But although there is a speed increase, there's also a snag. Whatever the processor, it will need to get data from the memory. And that data has to travel along wiring, which is known as a data bus. Now, for eight bits of data, you'll need eight tracks on your data bus. And if we look at this printed circuit board, there are a few chips, turn it over, and sure enough, there is the data bus. Those eight tracks really do exist. So, information can travel to the processor eight bits at a time. Well, you'll find an 8-bit data bus like this on the BBC, the Spectrum, Commodore 64, Atari 800 and so on, all the high street favourites. Now, you'd expect a 16-bit processor to have a 16-bit bus. Yes, well, true 16-bit machines do. And as this graphic shows, one tick of the computer's clock, a full, bit, a full 16 bits of information can travel to or from the processor. But 16 tracks makes all the circuitry very much more complex. So some machines, like the original IBM PC, actually cheat a bit. These are the so-called pseudo 16-bit machines, which have only an 8-bit bus. Now, of course, this creates a serious bottleneck of information. It slows the machine down. The processor now needs two gulps of that data to get the 16 bits it needs. So a true 16-bit machine with a 16-bit bus will be very much faster.
That helps to explain the relatively high speeds of, let's say, the Olivetti M24, the new Amstrad clone, the Nimbus and so on, compared with the IBM PC. Now, a 32-bit processor similarly could have a 32-bit data bus, like the expensive Compaq. But equally, you could have a 16-bit data bus. Cheaper, but you pay the price in performance. Now, you get this in machines like the new Atari and Commodore models. And would you believe you can even get a 32-bit processor with a grotty little 8-bit bus? And obviously, that now needs four gulps to get the information to the processor. In fact, this was one of the disappointing features of the ill-fated QL, which could chew rather more than it bit. Who was the QL aimed at? Well, <coughs> the thinking was that um, the marketplace had developed to the point where there'd be a huge market in serious machines. Now, I think that we got it wrong at that stage, and I think that Atari and Commodore have similarly got it wrong uh, in terms of market size, not in terms of the machines not being good. The truth is that 8-bit machines can do everything that people want at the moment, perhaps, more or less. And um, we've yet to discover ways to put 16 or 32-bit machines to use uh, that in a way that makes sense to the public. For the average home micro-owner or small businessman, Sir Clive may well be right. 8-bit machines are perfectly good and they're cheap. But they really can't work fast enough and they can't handle enough memory for serious business software. Well, one machine to watch then at the top end of the range is this. It's the new 32-bit Compaq 386, which uses the chip from Intel, which is likely to be the basis of any new IBM machine. Uh, Apricot failed in its attempt to set its own standard at the low end and pulled out of the market at that end. And it's now pinning its hope on this, the high-speed Zen, at the top end of the IBM compatibles. But uh, what about the old favourite? Let's have a look. Amstrad has launched a new Spectrum. Hmm, looks a bit like the old Amstrad to me. Then there's the new Apple II GS. It's a much more compact machine. And the interesting thing about this is that all the functions of the old Apple II have been sort of scrunched together or shrunk down into this, just the single chip. Acorn, which some people had left for dead, has edged back into profit since its takeover by Olivetti. Sales of the BBC Master Series are higher than anticipated, and this is largely because of a continuing expansion in the education market. This summer, they produced a cut-down version called the Compact, and this also comes with very smart livery for the design-conscious Italian market. Now, over the last few years, most hardware manufacturers have steadily increased the power or dropped the price of their machines, or sometimes both, partly by reducing the number of components needed. Well, Acorn certainly haven't dropped their prices, and we tackled Acorn's managing director, Brian Long, about this. The, the uh, rule of thumb that is used in the computer industry is that every 18 months or two years, you can either reduce the price of a machine by 50% or increase the performance of it by 50%. And I think it would be safe to say with the BBC microcomputer that over that period of time, Acorn has concentrated consistently on improving what can be done with the machine rather than purely in stripping cost out. Acorn's critics say that Acorn can retain its prices simply because it shelters behind the BBC contract. What's your reaction to that? I wish if that was true that it would be informed to our customers more so that we wouldn't have quite so much price competition with our customers. Unfortunately, our customers actually don't appear to take that view. They are very aggressive price shoppers when it comes to uh, boards of education, LEAs, they have a great deal of purchasing power and we have to be very price competitive and when they buy they actually don't pay us that much for the BBC logo. What you're saying is the only person who pays the full price for the BBC Micro is the man in the street. Uh, if the man on the street is buying a one-off he obviously gets a different price structure from somebody who is buying a hundred off or two hundred off. I think in any computer manufacturer would tell you the same thing. Well, if you use a modem to communicate down the phone lines, you'll know how costly that can be when the phone bill arrives. But when British Telecom was privatised, it lost its right to a monopoly service, which means that gradually we're getting a choice of telecommunications services and prices. In December, the other major carrier, Mercury, is extending its services to the ordinary domestic user. So BT will have a rival looking for business whenever you make that call. Uh, the telephone that we have uh, designed is two telephones in one. It's a telephone that will work 
uh, with the British Telecom network and a, a telephone that will work with the Mercury network because our telephone exchanges are modern electronic and use a different type of signalling or dialing than you do with the British Telecom. So in order to use the telephone, you pick up the telephone and first of all press the Mercury button. Now in pressing the Mercury button, what you do is to get the telephone to dial 131 on the British Telecom line and the Mercury Telephone Exchange will answer when the 131 is called and will send out a, a tone, that's a, a note, which uh, the phone will receive and will then send to the Mercury Exchange a six-digit authorization code which identifies you as a bona fide Mercury customer. Uh, one of the advantages you get, not only is that with, the, with the modern network that we're, we're offering, which is uh, fibre optics and digital and all that lovely technology, but it also means that you'll get an itemised bill. That means every telephone call you make on your bill will be itemised as the time you made it, the number you called, how long it lasted and what the cost of it was. Well, I think it would be reasonable to say somebody with a bill around about uh, £100 a quarter, it would be certainly worth their while uh, being a Mercury customer. When machines like the Beeb and the Spectrum first hit the markets, the manufacturers claimed that they had high-resolution graphics. Well, they didn't, of course, at least not in comparison with, say, your television set. But in the last few years, software writers have learned to exploit those graphic capabilities to the full, possibly spurred on by the boom in home games. Here's a recent offering. It's called Striker's Run. There's a little chap here. I can make him jump about or duck, and he can move left and right. And as you see, the background scrolls in quite a pleasing manner. Rather nice. But if you're not happy with what the games writers have to offer, you can now do your own animations. This is produced by a piece of software from... It's called Movie Maker from a company with the rather strange name of Slippery Slug. Well, yes, OK, the shapes are rather chunky, but you can make them do more or less anything you like. Even so, there is a limit to what you can do on an 8-bit machine. In the end, the, ha the hardware forces you to compromise both the quality of the picture and the smoothness of movement. But just see what the 32-bit Amiga can do. Here we have a classroom. The professor moves across. And those words sink pleasingly into the sunset. Well, that's pretty snazzy for a do-it-yourself animation. But how was it produced? Well, the drawings were done using this package, Paint, which we demonstrated in the last series. The animation is handled by another package called Deluxe Video. As you may have guessed, there was in fact not one little man, but several. Here they all are, and you can see there are just a few differences there. The legs are in different positions, and at the end here, we've made him face towards us. Now, of course, I can make changes to that animation. I'll just get rid of this chap first. Pull that screen down. Come on, down you come, that's it. Right. Now, get a shot of this little mini screen here. Now, this screen shows the so-called timelines of the action. There are seconds marked at the top up here. And these three lines control what happens. The first line here is the background, that's the classroom. And down here, there's the line about the professor, that's walk prof. He appears, he animates across the screen. And at the bottom, this is what happens to the words micro live. They appear and eventually they move. Now, let's change the action of that professor. So we need to change the animation of his legs. That's the rate at which they move. And we also need to change the rate at which he moves across the screen. So I'll move those both up there. That should make him a bit faster. Now I pull down a screen at the top here, a menu, and select play video, right, and that should get him cracking. Now, there's a bit of a pause while the computer sorts out all those instructions. Obviously, this is a demonstration, so it's a relatively simple piece of animation, but you could have lots of characters, lots of different scenes. You can even string them all together to make up a complicated story. Now, where is he? Ah, oh, yes, there's the classroom, there's the prof, and, as you can see, he moved a good deal faster than he did before. And the rest of the scene is exactly the same. Well, that is animation of a sort, and it's quite an achievement for a home micro. But that's about it. If you want real, high-resolution, three-dimensional computer animation, then you'll have to look elsewhere. Which is exactly what I did last night when I was invited to present the prizes to the winners of the Computer Animation Film Festival at Computer Graphics 86. Now, these people really do have the kit and the knowledge to produce something really stunning, like the winner of the state of the art category.
what a way to pull the plug out. Uh, again this year, one of the judges for the festival was Dr John Vince. Welcome back, John. Okay. Tell me, what was it that was so state-of-the-art about that piece? I, I suppose it's state-of-the-art in that it tackles problems that most people avoid. Um, those wonderful sequences of the, the light reflecting on the mm. balls and the texturing, uh, the refraction and the fractals, and that excellent sequence when the water drained out of the pond at the end, marvellous. Absolutely marvellous. marvellous. Yeah. In fact, things that one very rarely, or if ever, saw a few years ago. We, no, we mm. couldn't have done it. No. Well, it's fairly obvious that computer animation has come on a long way in the last few years. There's been a revolution in hardware with specially designed 32-bit machines, and there's been a revolution in software as more people come in to work on the problems. And this is an area that's no longer confined to the technical experts. Creative people, graphic designers are moving in, and computer animation companies are springing up everywhere. But of course, the name Virgin isn't exactly new. It's on high street record stores across the country. And you may have heard of the airline and the odd boat trip. So perhaps it's not surprising to discover that Virgin is moving into new areas. And that's why here in Soho, among the TV and film production companies, the name Virgin is also associated with a rapidly developing computer graphics company. Most of the people here are graphic designers. They've taken the latest hardware, a silicon graphics 32-bit multi-user system, and written their own software to exploit it to the full. The shapes to be animated are translated from the real world to the computer via a digitizer. What I'm doing with the digitizer is to uh, input a stream of coordinates into the computer. The coordinates form the basis for a surface which we will then be able to light and shade and treat like a normal surface. So it's very much like the first stage in carving something out of wood. Every time you press the button, you enter another point into the stream of coordinates. So by tracing around, pressing the button at regular points along the curve, you'll end up with a kind of approximation to a smooth curve. Now, this data is going to be fairly rough because there's no accurate way of kind of tracing around a curve. But what we can do is to come back and edit that later using uh, a special editing program which we've written to allow us to smooth these things out and kind of finish it off and make it look all nice and smooth. But the great secret of this system is that it can manipulate three-dimensional shapes in real time. The important thing about uh, animating on this system is that it allows you to use the, the buttons and dials over here to actually input to the animation. So having set the program running, I can kind of move my camera and my objects or anything else about in space just using these knobs. And I can actually see that happening. The moves can be stored in memory, smoothed and later edited if necessary. That's something that, that wasn't previously possible with kind of older computers and, and lesser forms of technology. The finished full colour image is constructed by software. Again, it's all stuff that's written in-house. What it does basically is take into account the position of the lights, the surface colour and texture and shininess of the object. It takes into account the, the position of the, the camera or the eye point in relation to those objects and then calculates the shading for every pixel of every object on the screen. But high resolution comes at a price. Because there are several calculations for every single pixel, it can take from 5 to 30 minutes for the computer to build up each frame of the finished animation. This company exists because graphic designers and a computer scientist persuaded Virgin that they could produce exciting new images by developing their own in-house software. But above all, they are still graphic artists, using the new technology to produce a new art style. Hmm. Well, since we finished that film, we asked Virgin Graphics if they would develop one of those ideas for us. They said yes, and here it is. Sort of simple but effective. Now, we've just heard how long it can take to build up even a single frame. So, John, can you tell us what sort of systems are in the pipeline and are being developed to help with this real-time work? Well, at, at Rediffusion Simulation, which is where I work in flight simulation graphics, we employ machine architectures that are totally different from the conventional computer. 
we have multiple parallel processors, no operating system to get into the way, um, video processors that are able to generate 3D shaded textured scenes at 50 frames a second, giving us our real-time graphics. Remember, as you're watching this, that every movement you can see is being calculated by the computer as it happens. It's not being built up frame by frame. And that appears to be so detailed, mm. considering it's real time. Yeah. OK, John, uh, what's so special about the next two pieces, that's heads and soliloquy, that we're about to see? OK, well, it must be remembered that the, the next two sequences are research student projects, mm. actually from uh, Middlesex Polytechnic. The first one is by uh, Samania Chung, called Soliloquy, and has some beautiful camera movements and wonderful scenic design. Uh, the second one is by another student called Keith Waters and called Heads, and he has looked at a very difficult problem, that is uh, the modelling of facial expression. Uh, and already Keith has gone a long way to solving a lot of these problems. OK, well, let's have a look. Soliloquy first. But the winner of the student section was Keith Waters with this. The right honourable gentleman, please shut up. The right honourable gentleman, please shut up. Well, that didn't only win Keith the, uh, the student section award, did it? No, Keith also won the, the Supreme Award in recognition for a, an amazing piece of animation for a student project. Tell me, where did Mrs Thatcher's sort of original head come from? Well, I'm sure you've seen Spitting Image on television. Yeah. yeah. Fluck and Law gave uh, Keith uh, a model of uh, Margaret Thatcher, and which was digitised and fed into the computer, and he animated it. Mm. Do you think we're ever going to see those sort of computer-animated sequences in television programmes? Oh, it's probably um, expensive to do it today, but who knows what's going to happen, say, in a year, two years' time. <laughs> I look yeah. forward to it. Mm. John, thanks very much for Pardon? joining us this evening. We'll be back at the same time next Friday when, amongst other things, we look at non-Zappo games and the Big Bang. But now, finally, tonight, a showreel that was seen at the festival and that we think you should see too. From all of us, good night.